Hello everybody, The Network Berg here. Hope you've been doing well. So this video is probably the most important lesson that I can hope to teach you. And it's been such a big deal for me that I've actually redone this video a few times. This I think is the fifth time I'm trying to do this because every time I try and explain this, I feel a little bit um, like I'm missing the point or I'm doing too much or I'm not giving enough information. So hopefully this is the, the good take. So it is about routing and it is something that you should be super excited about. I mean, if you're a network engineer, routing is your bread and butter. It is going to be the thing that takes the most out of your life, figuring out how to route traffic, why the routing is set up the way that it is, and just a ton of other things. I mean, it, it's really the backbone of everything about being a network engineer and you need to enjoy the routing aspect of it. It shouldn't be something that's confusing. It shouldn't be something that's annoying. You need to love it because that is where all of the cool stuff is happening. So I'm going to jump into the video. I've already set up a little visual diagram here, um, but I'll explain everything that's happening in the diagram. Now I just quickly want to do the intro and let's get into the video. All right, so before we jump into the video diagram, I just want to lay out, we're gonna cover theory now. So if you're not too interested in the theory, you feel free to jump onto the lab. I will put a timestamp for that. But I do feel like this is a very important topic to cover. Now, what is routing? Why do we need routing? So in essence, routing is a mechanism that allows us to learn how to get to different networks across either the internet or intranet or MPLS or anything. It is a way for us to exchange IP packets between networks so that we can actually reach other places. If routing doesn't, didn't exist, then we'd all be isolated on our own little islands and we wouldn't have essentially the internet. So our progress as a race would have stopped because the internet wouldn't really exist and we'd only store our information on our local networks. So it would be very limited to what we could learn and accomplish. Routing fixes all that. So routing has created the internet for us so that we can exchange packets between different routers and learn information and get to different things. So a good example of routing is if I go to google.com from my computer, it, that traffic is being routed by multiple routers, more than likely. Uh, if I do a ping to Google, I'll get a response. If I do a trace route to Google, I can see the hops of the routers that it takes in order to get to that uh, server where Google's stuff is hosted. Now, even your computer actually works as a router. How crazy is that? I bet some of you is new to the field didn't even know that. But if you open up, let's say your command prompt, so I'm gonna do that now myself. And from your command prompt, you could do something like a route print. And this would actually bring up your computer's routing table. So your computer has its own routes that are configured as well, that's set up to learn how to get to different things. And it's very important to understand how a routing table works because this in essence, this routing table is what networking <laughs> works on. So every device that is connected to the internet or to the network that interfaces with a network has a routing table. It might have a very minimal configuration on it, just something like what we call a default route in order to get network access, but it has a way to look at a database in order to figure out how to get to a different network. So that is the key. We need routing to get somewhere else. Now, how is routing determined? There's a few various factors. Um, what you need to understand is routes will always try and find the best possible route to get to a destination. Now, there's a few ways that that can be determined. Um, the first biggest thing that I think routers would generally look up is try and find a directly connected route. Now, what would a directly connected route be? That would be a route that is actually connected to my router. So a good uh, example would be on this visual diagram, you see I've got some computers and that each, each computer has their own subnet. So let's say this purple subnet is 172.16.00 slash 24, the computer is dot 29 and the router is dot one. And then we've got the blue network, 
which is 192.168.0.0/24, with the computer being .18 and the router being .1, and then we've got this orange network or gold network 192.168.100.0/24, with the computer being 100 and the router being .254. So a directly connected route doesn't necessarily have to mean that it is a computer that is physically connected with a single LAN cable to the router. That cable could be connected to a switch and that switch could uplink to the router on a port or on a VLAN. And if you configure that IP address subnet on the router on that VLAN or on that interface, that broadcast domain would exist there and the router would have a directly connected route on it for that specific subnet. So you might see a flag, we'll go over flags as well when we get into the lab, but a flag is basically like a description of what the route is. And you, you'll, you might see something like capital DAC, which would mean something like directly active and connected. And that's very important because when the router is doing its route lookup and the route is a directly connected route, the directly connected route will always take preference because I think its distance is anyway set to something like zero on the routing table and distances are also so important because distances would determine which route is also partly the better route um, on a priority scheme it, it's still not the, the biggest thing but distance is also a major factor because generally the route with the lowest distance would also win so let's say um, we've got this router and it's got two different routes to get to 192.168.100.0. One route meaning it, it can go over this router and another route, which would mean it would go over this router, then this router, then this router, which is the, the left hand side is definitely more what we would call a hop because each time traffic passes between routers, we call that a hop. Now the left hand side, there's more hops and the right hand side is it's a single hop for me to get to that subnet, but I might have two separate routes. And how would the router know which route is actually the best one? I mean, if I was running maybe a routing protocol that did stuff like hop counts, which is rip, which is a different thing in its, in its own, uh, <laughs> and we'll cover that separately. But if you had a routing protocol that did hop counts, it would still prefer the hop that only had one hop. But we, we're, we're not going to do that. We're just going to have static routes. So we need to determine how are we going to get to this 192.168.100.0 subnet from this bottom router. And we have two options. We can either route traffic on the link on the left hand side or the link on the right hand side. Now, both links have, let's say, um, the same distance. If that happens, then essentially what happens is you create a load balance, which is also another topic we, we'd go into completely separately. But if the routes were different in administrative distance, so it's the same subnet 192.168.100.0/24, and a route to the right hand side had a lower distance. So let's say the distance was 10. For the right hand side but the distance is 20 for the left hand side then the route on the right hand side would be preferred because it's got a lower distance it's more preferred now the third biggest thing and this is actually more important than the distance is the longest prefix set so when you think routing you, and you see these subnets so 192.168.100.0 slash 24 that's the subnet so if we were on this router, and let's say there, there were two different routes. So I'm just going to copy that quickly. So let's say on this router, 192.168.100.0 slash 24, that route existed with an administrative distance of 10. And I'm just going to duplicate that. And let's say again, it's the same route, same route but we're going to change the subnet to slash 25. And the distance will keep the same. So the distances are the same. So let, let's, let's move it actually across. So let's say 192.168.100.0 slash 25. 
uh, with a distance of 10 will be routed over the left hand link and then while 192.168.100.0 slash 24 with also distance 10 will be routed over the right hand link so what do you think would actually happen do you think this computer would send a packet to the router and then the router would look at its routing table and then which one do you actually think the router will prefer if it needs to get to let's say dot 100 not dot 254 but dot 100 so the router will receive the packet and this prefix on the left hand side is actually the longer prefix now what do we mean by that well if if you remember a thing or two about subnetting if we need to put that slash 25 into a subnet format 255.255.255.128 so that is the subnet for a slash 25 and the slash 24 on the right hand side the subnet is 255.255.255.0 so the subnet on the left hand side is actually the bigger one the longer one and because of that reason that route is going to be preferred when trying to get to 192.168.100.100 so traffic would actually leave over this left hand path and then it would follow this router until it eventually got to this computer so this is a very um difficult uh, i won't say it's a it, it's a difficult concept but when you're new to the networking it, it might be confusing when you see a lot of different routes but always try to remember the longest prefix route would be more preferred even if there is a lower administrative distance the longest prefix match will also play a huge factor because that is the route that the router will try and take as well now if no route is able is, is picked up on the router so let's say no routing existed to get to 192.168.100.0/24 for this bottom router so this computer sends its packet the router looks at it and it says hmm how can i get there i don't have any type of routing information what the router would do in that type of scenario there, there's two events either the router will say i don't have this in my routing table and then it will see if it has a default route now a default route in essence i'm going to copy again a default route and i showed this to you in the command prompt as well is this 0 .0 .0, 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0.0 subnet so that is a default route it's basically any subnet if your router has a default route any traffic that's not on the routing table will follow the default route so then it will just pass that traffic on to the next hop so in my case let's just say we put it on the left so this computer will go to its router and say hey i want to get to this 192.168.100.100 computer how do i get there the router will say i don't know but i do have a default route maybe the guy up there knows so he just forwards the packets onto the next hop onto the next on its on its default route and it kind of just hopes that this router knows how to get there but if this router doesn't know how to get there the packets will just be dropped or discarded and that's also another thing that i want to mention is if there is no default route defined on this router or on any of the routers for that matter you don't need to define default routes but if you want internet you kind of need them but if there is no routing information on a router for a given network once it receives that packet and it does it sees it can't get there in any way it will just discard the packets it will leave them it will abandon them so that it doesn't try and route that traffic and utilize cpu when it doesn't need to so that in essence is how routing works and how routing decisions are made um, i've also said i've set up this little video diagram for you and i've, I've gone through the explanation so you, you already know there's some lan networks but besides the lan networks the important part will be this middle part with all of the routers in it because these routers have links between each other and then with these links we will then set up routing on how to get to different networks through each of the routers and we'll also set up some internet connectivity just so that everything can work so this covers the theory part of the routing we'll now move into the actual lab part 
Okay, so our topology is set up and we're ready to learn about routing. So this will be pretty much a hands-on lab where we will define all of the routes on the network and we will specify how everything will go in and out and make everything work. So as per our topology that we set up on Visio, we do have three networks, um, these ones that are highlighted in different colors. And we're going to basically be setting up routing between these networks as well as give these networks internet access. Currently, we only have IP addresses set up between the routers and these PCs can get to their local routers. So let's begin the routing process um, by starting with router one, which is the bottom router. And I'm just going to open up Winbox and I'm going to connect to this internet router, but I'm gonna connect through Ramon because I've got Ramon configured between all of these routers. So I can access router one, username admin, password blank for this lab. And let's see what's going on here. Okay, so first things first, let's open up the routing table of the router. So to get there, you go to IP and you'll go to routes. Now in routes, this will give you a brief rundown of the routing table of the router, which routes it knows about. And if it's blank, it doesn't know any routes. So as I said in the theory section, you get different fields. So the first field that we get in the routing table, this is the flags field. So all of these uh, letters, they mean something. So if we just hover over the, the letter, and we'll tell you exactly D, A, C. So this is a dynamic active and connected route. So we know this route should exist on the router. Um, next field that we get is the destination address. So this defines subnet information. Do I have a route for it? So here you'll see if this slash 30, if there was other routes, it might be a slash 24, slash 23. So think about this part as the, the longest prefix match. It, it will check here in the destination addresses. Do I have routes for this destination? And what the prefix is, and then the longest prefix matches the route we'll choose. Next, you'll get your gateway. So in this uh, routing table, you'll see the gateway is just the interfaces. But typically on a routing table, your gateway would be maybe an IP address of a next hop, how to get to the other network. The reason it's the interface here is because these IP ranges are directly defined on these interfaces because they're directly connected. Next up, we have our distances. So the distance, again, the lowest distance always wins. So zero for the directly connected route will always win. It will always be the, the favorite route. Um, if you create an admin route or a static route, the distance by default is one, I believe. And then that would be your next best um, routing mark. We're not going to get into that in this lab. It's more advanced. There's a lot of things that you'll do with routing marks, especially with BRFs and manipulating traffic. So don't worry too much about the routing mark. And then you've got your pref source. So basically if you run a ping to this network, the pref source is the IP address. It will basically be pinging from or be pinging as now we're going to create another network just so I can show you that the directly connected route is formed when we add the IP on the router. So I'm just gonna go into my IP addresses and let's keep the box small. So keep an eye on this route list as well. If I go plus here and I add, let's say 1.2.3.4 slash 24, and I maybe put that on ether three. If I apply that, you'll see it creates a directly connected route automatically for us, which is 1.2.3.0 slash 24. So it's the whole network, the whole subnet, and it's on ether three. So I'm just going to remove this IP address because this was just to demonstrate how directly connected routes are learned on your router. Now, the next thing we want to do is actually add some static routes. So I've got router one open and we've got this PC at the bottom. So I'm just going to jump onto this PC as well. Just double click it, open it. And I just first want to see from this PC, can I ping my default gateway, which is 192.168.0.1. So let's just see, I can ping my default gateway. Now I've got other networks here. Um, I'll have a look at what these PCs IPs are now, but I know that the router here is 172.16.0.1. So let's see, can I ping that from this router? 
0.0.1. And sorry, I don't mean router, I mean from the host. So I'm getting a unreachable a reply. So what does that mean? It means from this computer, it's trying to do a ping because its default gateway is router one. So it's sending the packet to router one and then router one is doing a lookup against its own routing table. So let's ma maximize that. And it does not have a route for 172.16.0.0 slash anything. So it doesn't know how to get there. So it's basically just responding to the PC. I don't know how to get there. I can't help you. Um, and then we're getting that unreachable address. But since we know what the topology looks like, we can actually add static routes. Now this is where you're going to make a administrator route. And we're just going to click on this plus and then you get a DST address. So remember it's this address that we can specify. So in my topology, I know it's 172.16.0.0 slash 24. So that's my destination. Then I need to know what is my gateway? How do I get there? So I can't just say the interface IP because it, it might be there's more than one IP address on the interface. So there are cases where you can do that, especially with point to point networks, but you'll rarely be dealing with that. Um, and I'll make a video separately on that. But in our case, we want to route specifically to a certain IP. Now the IP address that we're going to route to is actually the IP configured between these routers. Now this is where this network comes into play 10.10.1.0 slash 30. So on router one, let's just see what is our IP 10.10.1.1. So my next hop will be router two's IP address on its, let's say WAN interface. So that IP should be 10.10.1.2. So if I, let's also just go into router two to verify that, because I don't want to confuse you with this stuff. So I'm just gonna climb on again, open up another Roman session, and I'm going to go onto router two. So on router two, if I go onto the IP routes, similarly, only my directly connected routes are there. If I go into the IP address, so let's see, ether two, the IP address for ether is 10.10.1.2. So that's correct. So on router one, I'm going to say, to get to this network, to get to 172.16.0.0 slash 24, please, I'm going to use 10.10.1.2 as my gateway that's how i'm going to get to that address so i'm just going to make this bigger again we can look at a few of the other things check gateway you can use that just to verify that the gateway is up it's pretty useful but you'll also rarely use that the type of traffic so we're going to use this as unicast the distance if we leave it blank as i said it should make it one and the scope and target scope we don't need to touch that so for a normal static route this is basically all you need. You need your destination address and you need your gateway address. So I'm going to click on the apply and then you'll see it added a new route. So this route, it's an active and static route and it's using 172.16.0.0 slash 24 and the gateway is 10.10.1.2 and our distance is one. So distance we can also increase and it won't change anything. The route will still exist. It was, it's just if there was another route for this, the route with the lower distance would take preference. Okay, so if I go back onto my virtual PC here, do you think I'll be able to get to 172.16.0.1, which is the LAN IP of the router on router two? It's, it's this IP that's configured on the LAN. Do you think I can get there? Let's do a ping and see. Oh no, it's failing. So I'm getting a different error message. Now I'm just getting a timeout. So I'm not getting an unreachable anymore. And the reason being is the traffic is getting forwarded to router two, but it's not coming back. And this is a, a law. I think it's a law of physics, right? So what, what goes up must come down. So what you route out needs to come back in as well. And it's not that you need to route 172.16.0.0/24 back into our own router. It's more of router two doesn't know how to get to our own computer to our 192.168.0.0/24 subnet. It doesn't know how to get back to us. 
So we're just going to add a static route for that. So let's jump into router two, go into the routing and let's add a route. So let's say 192.168.0.0 slash 24. And our gateway will be 10.10.1.1. Let's apply this. Now we've added the static route on router two. So router one knows how to get to this 172.60 network and router two knows how to get to this 192.168.0.0 slash 24 network. So I'm gonna jump back on this virtual PC and this should actually work now. So let's quickly do a test and see, can we ping 172.16.01? Yes, we can ping it. So we've set up a static route between router one and router two in order for these two networks to communicate with each other. That's awesome. So if you got that, congratulations. That's a big role in routing, understanding how the traffic leaves and how it comes back in. And let's do a similar thing on router one. Let's not lose this tempo. So on router one, let's also set up routing to get to 192.168.100.0 slash 24. So I'm just going to go back into router one. And from router one on our routes, Let's make the window small so we can see our subnets here. So I'm gonna click on the plus. I'm going to add a route for 192.168.100.0 slash 24. And my gateway, think about it, what will my gateway be? So we're, we're using this ether3 to ether1 network. So 10.10.2.0 slash 30. This is the network between our routers, our WAN network. So we're going to use the gateway as, so for router one, the gateway will be the IP that's here on router three. So I'm going to use 10.10.2.2. And then we can just apply that. And then vice versa, I'm just going to jump onto another Winbox session and connect onto Ramon to router three. Awesome. So let's go into our routes. You see it's only directly connected routes here. So let's click on the plus and let's add here 192.168.0.0 because remember we're adding a return route now from router three to router one in order to have the networks communicate. So our gateway is going to be 10.10.2.1. I'm just going to apply that and then we can verify it as well by just looking at the topology. So 10.10.2.1 is router one and dot two is router three. So I'll jump back onto this virtual PC and let's see, can I ping 192.168.100.254 is actually the IP address for router three for the LAN portion. And I can ping that. Let's see, can I ping dot 100 because that was the IP address of this virtual PC. And yes, I can ping it. Awesome. So from router one, we can get to the network of router two and the network of router three. And that means their networks can get back to us as well. Now, let's see from VPC five, the one on the left, the PC on the left. If I do a ping to 192.168.100.100, will it work? No. Why won't it work? because we don't have any routing. You saw we're getting that unreachable address error again. So if I go on to router two and I look at my routing table, because remember this PC is now going to its default gateway and its default gateway is looking at its own routing table and its own routing table, it doesn't have any, any routes set up. So there's one more router I actually wanna do the setup on and it's the intranet router. So let's just open up Winbox and then I'm going to just connect straight to my neighbor. And that is actually this internet router. So on this internet router, let's also add some routes. How do I know it's internet router? Because it's connected directly to my internet. And if I ping stuff like 8.8.8.8, .8 .8, I can break out from here. From the internet router, can I ping anything else? Let's try and ping 192.168.0.1. I can't ping that. Let's try and ping 172.16.0.1, which is the LAN IP of 
router 2. Now I can't ping that. Let's try and ping 192.168.100.254, which is the LAN IP of router 3. No, I cannot ping that. Why? Let's look at our writing table. IP routes. I don't have any routes for it. So I have a default route, which will just push all of the traffic over to the internet. So let's add a route for all three of those networks. So let's say if we want to get to, if we want to get to 172.16.0.0/24, then our gateway will be 10.11.0. And I think that's dot two, but let's confirm, let's go to router two. And let's look at the IP address of router two of this ethernet one interface. So it is 10.10.1.2. So I'm going back to the internet router. Now that should be 10.11.0.2. Let's just apply that and see if it actually picks up on ether2. Okay, that's correct. Okay. Let's quickly see, can I ping? 172.16.0.1 now. Yes, I can. All right, so let's add similar routing for the other networks. So router 3's network was 192.168.100.0 slash 24. And my gateway will be 10.11.1.2. Going to apply that. And then lastly, I have a direct link to router 1 from the internet router. So let's just make this 192.168.0.0/24, and then our gateway will be 10.18.1.2. Going to apply that. I'm going to hit OK. So from this router, I'm going to ping all my networks. So I already know I can get to 172.16. So let's try 192.168.0.1. I can get there. Perfect. And can I get to 100.254? Yes, okay. So from the internet router, I can actually get to all of the networks now. So this is pretty cool because we can do all kinds of fun stuff now. The big thing I wanna show you now is adding a default route. So on router one, if I go into the routing table, I'm going to hit the plus, we're going to add a default route. So if we hit the plus by default, it's already adding that for us, but you could just add it as 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, and then your gateway. So on router one, our default route, we're going to make this the internet router. So we can add that as 10.18.1.1 because that's going to be the IP address of the internet router's WAN address, and we can apply that. So if I go into this, Micritic and I ping 8.8.8.8. .8 I get internet as well. Cool. That's awesome. And I'm just going to see from this virtual PC. Can I get there? I should not have closed Winbox, but it's fine. We'll reopen it. So from the virtual PC. Is it up? Let's see. This looks a bit strange. Let's just close this box. Maybe I, st oh, I still have it open here. Okay. 8.8.8.8. .8 awesome. So even from the virtual PC, I have internet access because of the routing we've configured. I just want to set up similarly different default routes on the other routers. And I might actually do this on the command line for router 2 now since I closed Winbox. And I still want to show you on Winbox how routing looks as well. Or not on Winbox, on, on the command line. So if we do a IP route print, it will show you all of the routes that's currently on the router. Ex also what the flags are. So just like on Winbox, you got a flags, destination, preference source, gateway, distance. So let's add a default route through command line. So we're going to just type IP route, add destination address equals 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0. Our gateway will be 10.11 so 10.11.0.1 awesome let's see do i have internet access from this router i do i do perfect now let's go on to router 3 just to do it on there as well 
just to finish this off. So we're going to IP routes. We're going to add a default route to 10.11.1.1. I just want to confirm. That's right. So we're going to apply that. And let's see, do we have internet access from router three? We do. Okay. Awesome. So we can actually get to the internet from the internet router and we can get to our LAN networks between all of the devices. But I want to show you something else that's pretty cool. So let's go back onto router one. So I actually think I closed router one's Winbox. So let's just Winbox on again, connect to Roman, get to router one. There we go. So on router one, I have routes for 172.16.00/24, as well as 192.168.100.0/24. If I disable this route, let, let's disable both of the routes. So I can disable them just by selecting them and clicking on this cross. If and if you hold in control, then you can select multiple routes. So I'm just going to disable them. Now that they're disabled, if I go onto this virtual PC again, will I be able to ping either of those networks? Let's see. So let's ping 172.16.0.1. I can ping it, holy smokes. <laughs> Why can I ping it? So let's see, can we actually do trace route from this machine? I'm not sure if it does. Let's see, trace 172.16.0.1. It can do trace. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So we've actually caused a, a situation, but it's not too bad. Um, but we're doing a bit of asymmetric routing now. So that's like routing traffic over one link and it's coming back over the other link. And the reason for this is on router one, even though we've disabled the routes to get to 172.16.00/24 and 192.168.100.0/24, we still have that default route and that pushes it to the internet router. And this internet router still knows how to get to those networks. So that's why we can actually still pass and get to those networks. If I disable the routing for those other routers as well, we'd still have full communication because they're all using this internet router as the default router. And this router knows how to get to all of the networks. So you can see how cool it is that we can actually push traffic however we want and we can tune it and we can decide which paths to follow on the network. So maybe we know this link in the middle is bad and then we could set up different routes in order to make things work better. So this has been an introduction into routing and I hope, I hope this stuck to you because this is really some of the coolest stuff you can do is routing on routers. It's really fun and interesting to build the system, these roads. It's so cool. And I'd like to thank you for watching. If you haven't, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it. I appreciate it so much. And I'll catch you in the next video. See ya.